So sometimes doubt comes when we boast of too many things. Sometimes doubt comes because we spend too many hours, too many days, too many weeks allowing the warmth of fellowship with God to, to cool. And God becomes somewhat of a stranger. Married couples should never uh, spend days without communicating on an honest and a loving basis. It, it keeps the warmth of a friendship, uh, the warmth of a relationship going. I know the saying, absence makes the heart grow fonder, but uh, that's, that's uh, only so long and only so much. In order to have healthy, vibrant faith, we need to stay in the presence of the living God on a regular basis. David said, early in the morning will I lift up my voice unto the Lord. Early will I seek you. And that should be the habit of our life. You know, doubts are common things. How many of you have learned to doubt the weatherman? <laughs> and I, I've learned to doubt my culture. Just because everybody says it's okay. Just because everybody says it's cool. As a matter of fact, anymore, anytime something becomes popular, I immediately suspect it as being uh, either a communist plot or the work of the devil. I mean, it's got to be one of the two. There are some things you should doubt. I was uh, taking some scraps of board and throwing together a little cold frame. I've got some spinach and some beets growing, and I thought, well, you know, they're not going to make it before frost. So I threw together a little, little frame, and I, I picked up one board, kind of grabbed it in the middle, and it went kick, kick, just like that. And, and I, I grew to, I, I came to the place I was doubting every board I picked up because the termites had found them and, and they had made little burrows through them and some of them were just, you know, like that. So I had to, it's good, it's good to doubt things that shouldn't be trusted in. There's an old, uh, I don't know whether it was Creek or Cherokee proverb, strong faith in weak plank put Indian in Creek. That's the English translation. You could put your faith in the wrong thing, you see. So doubting some things is appropriate. But when it comes to doubting God, doubting His character, doubting His mercy, doubting His truthfulness, will He actually do what He said? Now I'm not going to ask for a show of hands again, but you know and I know that you've had times doubting whether or not God actually knew your address. See, blessings coming to other people, but you happen to be go, going through a time of, of testing, a time of trouble, and uh, I don't want that to bother any of you compulsive people. How many of you are picking that up in your mind? <laughs> you see, Sometimes our doubts concerning God are of a lack of information, a lack of experience. And sometimes they're a lack of character on our part. Doubting Thomas, John chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus. By the way, Thomas and Didymus, those two mean exactly the same thing. One is the Chaldee word and the other is the Greek word. And they both mean twin. So uh, several times he's called Didymus. And of course, all the rest of the time he's called Thomas. And both of them mean twin. So it must be Thomas had a twin. I don't know whether it's a brother or sister. But Thomas had a twin. We don't know anything about him. Don't speculate. But that's his name. Now, when the disciples were in that room on the night of his resurrection, Jesus popped in and they saw him. They saw him and they were glad. They saw him and they believed. They saw him and he breathed upon them and they received the Holy Spirit. They saw him and he commissioned them. He says, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. But, it says in verse 24... Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So he did not have the benefit of those experiences. So we're not excusing behavior, but we're recognizing the causes of his behavior. The other disciples therefore said to him, Man, we have seen the 
Lord. You say, that's not in the text. Well, if I was there, that's how I would have said it. Wow! I'd have said, awesome! You know, we ought to use awesome concerning God. He's the only one that deserves that title. And we have seen the Lord! We have seen Him! And Thomas, who was by nature analytical, he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into... He, he, he didn't want to be fooled by makeup. Put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side. Now I don't think Thomas was there on the hill when the Roman soldier shoved the spear into the side of Jesus after he was dead to prove that he was dead. But he got good word of it. The others, John had seen it. Others had seen it. He said, unless I see that and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now at this point, we don't know just necessarily the nature of his doubt. Because when a person says, I will not believe, we don't know whether they mean they've made a decision that they refuse to believe, or whether they're saying, you know, unless I have more evidence, I, I can't believe. Please understand me, there's a vast difference in doubts. Some people don't doubt. Some people have made the decision, I refuse to believe. We'll talk about that in a minute. And that kind of doubt can damn you for eternity. Oh, preacher, use that word. Well, that's the proper definition of it. Condemn. It will condemn you for all eternity. But there's another kind of doubt, an honest doubt, a seeking doubt, a hungry doubt. It's okay. It's okay to go through those things. You know, uh, Dr. Lister was a man ahead of his times. A man that was ridiculed for his theories on microbes and, and bacterial diseases. Many times he, he doubted his own theory. And when you doubt something, you go through the scientific method. You prove it. You check it under controlled conditions to see if it's so or if it's not so. And because of a good healthy doubt, Dr. Lister provided the foundation for a sterile operating room. Man, how I wish that guy had, his information had gotten out before the Civil War. There had been a whole lot of folks that wouldn't have died because of filthy surgeons' instruments. Uh, the, the corpsmen and the doctors killed more people than many balls did in the Civil War. It's healthy to doubt some things and to have certain kinds of doubt, but it is unhealthy to have the other kind. Now, there are famous doubters in the Bible, you know. Thomas is not the only one. Why don't we talk about doubting Gideon? Now, with the, the, the young adults class is studying about Gideon, and, you know, Gideon was just a man that needed more data. He wasn't sure. God, is that you? Is that really you? Is that really what you want? And, you know, Gideon went back a couple of times. Laid his little, little furry cloth out on the ground a couple of times. Why? Because Gideon wanted to be sure that it was God. He wanted to be sure that he got it right from God. Because when he got it right, man, he stood up against hundreds of thousands of the enemy with what? 300 guys. Well, you talk about being severely outnumbered. Listen to me. <laughs> there was not a doubter in that bunch because he told them. He said, the Lord told me that any of y'all are scared, any of y'all doubt, go on home. 20,000 went home. Now, we could get on to Gideon and say, doubting Gideon. But I look at him as what the angel of the Lord called him, a mighty man of valor. Now, when the Lord called him a mighty man of valor, he didn't know he was a mighty man of valor. He was a mighty man of valor in training, you see. God was raising up a man. And sometimes you have to have doubts as a part of that process. And then, John the Baptist. May I remind you that Jesus, the Son of God, called John the Baptizer the greatest man born of woman. 
greatest. But John the Baptist, when he was in Herod's prison, in the dark and the depression of those days, he, I mean, this is a man that stood up and said, there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. This man, I'm not worthy to unlatch his sandal. Jesus said, baptize me. He said, Lord, I should be baptized by you, not vice versa. This is a man who knew. This is a man who was sure. But this is a man that had a time of darkness and weakness and doubt. But what did he do with his doubt? What did Gideon do with his doubt? He took it to God. And I want to challenge you today. Take your doubts to God. Deal with your doubts. And my suggestion to you, if you want a title for this sermon, is the doubt eraser. The doubt eraser. How many of y'all ever use a Mr. Clean eraser sponge? You ever use that thing? That is one, and that doesn't last very long. I mean, it's got a short life, you know. <laughs> you wouldn't want to send that quarter back out in the first quarter. Save him for the fourth. But, uh, boy, it works so well. It, it just takes things away that nothing else will. Jesus is the doubt eraser. And if you'll bring your doubts, you know, doubts are like a, a big, ugly mark across the scenery. You ever seen an artist painting a beautiful scenery? He's got all this background and mountains and lake and beautiful stuff. And then all of a sudden he takes that old black thing and whoosh, 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 and you say, ugly. Why did he do that? And you doubt. Has that guy got any sense at all? I mean, if I could paint that well, I would not mess it up like he just did. We doubt his plan. We doubt his intelligence. We doubt his skill. But you know, if the old painting would just stay on the easel and not jump down and run away saying, Oh no, he's put marks on me. But just stay there. The artist will step back up and say, Watch me turn those marks into trees, you see. I'm going to make it even prettier. You see, many times... Doubts come because we see in part. We understand in part. But if we will take those doubts to the doubt eraser, He will remove them completely. I can't begin to categorize all of the doubts that I have had concerning God. At one time in my life, I genuinely and sincerely made the decision to doubt that God existed. I did. Not proud of it. But I did. I doubted that the Word of God was true. I doubted that it applied to me. I doubted uh, many of the miracles. I doubted all kinds of things. You know what one of the most difficult and pernicious doubts I've ever had? When I finally began to get right with God, I don't think I ever questioned His power. When I tasted and see, had seen that the Lord was good, when I tasted of His power, I'm telling you, when I called upon the Lord Jesus to save me, brother, He saved me. He took the dirt out of my life. He made me clean, and He put the peace of God right square in the core of who I am. I've, I don't think I've doubted the power of God. I, I don't think God has any problem filling these pews. I don't think God has any problem saving this community. If it wasn't for the, for the fact that I believed that God would do that, I wouldn't be preaching the gospel. But I do not doubt that the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's why I tell everybody. And if you're not telling everybody, it might be because you doubt the power of the gospel. But preacher, I don't doubt the gospel. I just doubt my ability. Yes, you're doubting the gospel. Because your ability's got nothing to do with it. It's the message that's the power of God unto salvation to them that believe. 
everywhere the gospel of Jesus Christ has gone and there's been a believing here, lives have been changed. Permanently, eternally, wonderfully, joyfully. But I tell you what I have doubted. I've doubted that God would. I never doubted that He could after I finally met Him. But many a time, oh sorry, unbelieving soul I am. I've doubted that He would. You know why you doubt that God would do something for you? Because you doubt the fact that He loves you. I can understand why God would love my wife. She's a nice person. She's kind. She's gentle. There's others of you in this room. I, I, I see why God loves you. I love you. I, you know, hang out with some of you. You can't help but love you. There's good things in you. It just draws that affection right out of a person. But there have been times, oh, God wouldn't do that for me. I doubted not that He could, but that He would, that He loved me in that way. You know, I guess it's a leftover scar from living as a sin-hardened soul. There have been many a time that I thought, to be truthful with you, I can't understand why anyone would love me. And there were times in my life that I didn't think there was anything lovable about me. And the reason I married this woman is because she loved me. And that was an outstanding thing. I was one of the most insecure, I, I don't know why I'm sharing this, because i got teenagers on the front row. I was the most insecure teenager in high school. I only took like two, three people out on a date, because I was scared to ask. I said, boy, you are a jerk, aren't you? Well, I really was. I was afraid they were going to say no. Now, what's worse? Not going to the event or asking somebody and they saying, with you? <laughs> so I didn't ask too many folks out. We all have our own insecurities. By the way, dating in high school is not a good idea anyway. Ladies, the guys are not mature until they're about 25 or 30, if they make it then. And guys, you don't know what to do. You don't know how to properly treat a lady. You, you, you hang out with the crowd. Don't be in, in, encumbered with all that stuff until you're ready to get serious about courting and, and finding a serious life partner. But that kind of insecurity, I guess, is kind of endemic to the whole human race. And we, uh, maybe sometimes, we, we, we're kind of like a, a pogo stick, up and down. There's sometimes we're so inflated with a self-importance, and then we, we don't believe anybody could possibly love us. There are times that I doubted that God would love me that much. I don't doubt His Word, but I'm not one of His special ones. I'm not one of His, you know, talented ones. I had the opportunity uh, Monday night to go and, and spend some time with some pastors and we, we talked about the pastors conference coming up in November and Dr. Jerry Vines was there and I tell you I just love Dr. Vines. He has always been a hero of mine, a powerful expositor of the Word of God. But I want you to know at 79 years he has become such a kind, gentle, sweet understanding person. I, I think I told Brother Lee this week, I hope that as I get older I get sweeter. I, I, I'd like to. I'd like to lose some of this old crust. I'd like to be kind. But I thought, you know, God would love somebody like Dr. Vines. Well, he was a pastor of the Dolphin Way Baptist Church down there in Mobile and, and then he became the pastor of that great First Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. What a powerful man of God. God would love somebody like that, but why would He love me? The fact of the matter is, Jesus came into the world for the least and the last and the lost. Do you know why God loves us? He loves us because of His grace. You know what grace is? It's unmerited favor. He loves us because we don't deserve to be loved. That's a fact. He couldn't love us any other way because we're not worthy because of His great mercy, because of His great grace. He has chosen to love us. I know. You sit there, 14, 15, 16, 18 years old, you say, why would God love me? I got acne. 
I'm awkward. I don't know how to deal with social situations. I'm failing in math. I mean, everything's going against me. Why would God love me? Why, even my mom and dad can't stand me sometimes. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But they go on feeding you. They go on clothing you and housing you. Looking out for you. You see, the love of God is manifest in that way. Well, let's not talk about my doubts. Let's talk about Thomas just a minute. Now, as I said, doubting can be a practical matter. It can be part of an ongoing process. If doubting is nothing but unwillingness to trust God, that is the ultimate sin. But if my doubt is practical, it's an indication that I don't have all the necessary facts. It's an indication that I have not sufficiently faced sufficient facts. Or it's an indication that I'm blind to some truth because I'm morally or spiritually compromised. But Thomas was an honest doubter because Thomas was an honest seeker. If I'm going to be a doubter, I want to be a doubter like Thomas. You see, Thomas's advantage is that he did not claim to understand what he did not understand. Listen to that. That's important. Thomas didn't claim to understand what he didn't understand. Thomas saw Jesus taken captive. I don't know whether he was in the crowd that saw him beaten and bloodied carrying the cross to Golgotha, but he got news of it. And he knew that Jesus was sown in weakness. He was laid into the grave in weakness. And he was stumbled by it. He was struggling with it. The hopes that these men had of Jesus being the Messiah, fulfilling the promises of God for the nation of Israel. Thomas, he didn't understand it. And when the other guys walked up to him and said, we saw the Lord. He said, I'm going to have to see it. I'm going to have to touch it. He was willing to admit he didn't get it. He didn't grasp it. This is an honest seeker. We need to be transparent with our own heart. Now, the other ten that were in that upper room, or they had first-hand evidence of the most fantastic claim in history. They said in verse 25, We have seen the Lord. And their revelation of the resurrected Lord came to them on nail-scarred feet, visible, hearable, Touchable. Thomas didn't see that. And Thomas didn't understand how it could be so. And so he said, except I see, I will not believe. Let's talk about the reasons for being a doubter. First of all, we all begin as doubters. We're all born in sin. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4, it talks about the devil trying to keep everybody in the dark. He calls him the God, little g, not big g, little g. He calls him the God of this world, that he has blinded the minds of them that don't believe. Lest the light of the glorious gospel, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We all begin in the darkness of doubt. Because we have an enemy working overtime to keep us from seeing. That's why preachers say you've got to open the Bible. You've got to spend time with God. Why? Because you've got to open the Bible. You've got to spend time with God. Faith comes by and hearing by. It's not going to come anywhere else. You're not going to grow in faith watching Fox News. You're not going to grow in faith watching CNN. You're not going to grow in faith watching soap operas. You're not going to grow in faith watching NCIS. Or Blue Bloods or whatever you watch. There's only one place that faith is going to come. And that's by the Word of God. And we all start out in darkness because the devil's trying to keep us there. Now, there's another reason for doubt. By the way, Church, we talked about this last week. This is a problem that we can solve. Many people are living in doubt because they have a lack of information. I had a lack of information yesterday. Was it yesterday? No, it was Friday. Friday. But I had the glorious condition of being up in Tekoa 
And uh, coming back from Tacoa, uh, I noticed a gas station with gasoline for a dollar and eighty-eight cents. Yeah. I didn't know that everybody was out of gas. I didn't know that gas was two dollars and thirty-nine cents everywhere else. But as I came down eighty-five, all the gas station, two thirty-nine, two forty-nine. I thought, wow, I paid a dollar eighty-eight. That's that's like fifty cents a gallon different. Now see, if you didn't know that there was a problem with gasoline, the pipeline broke, 250,000 gallons of gas spilled out in the ground, you wouldn't know that some stations didn't have a supply. And therefore, the gougers were out there raising the price, you know, supply and demand. If you have a lack of information, you have reason to doubt. Romans 10, 14 plainly says, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? How many of you trusted the Lord Jesus as your Savior before you ever heard about him? Anybody? Pretty impossible, isn't it? Can I ask you a question? Oh, this is the meddling moment. Put on your steel-toed shoes. Guard yourself. Do you know for a fact that your next door neighbor has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Do you know for a fact that the one next to them has heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? Have your children? Have your parents? Have your brothers and sisters? I don't care if they argue with you. Don't worry about their arguments. The interesting thing about the truth. You know, my wife asked me to reach into the oven yesterday. She made some shepherd's pie. She makes it in a big iron skillet and, you know, ground beef and stuff in there and then uh, cornbread on the top. And it's been in the oven a little while and it's been real hot. And I grabbed one of those cheap Walmart uh, hot things and it became a hot thing real quick. <laughs> You see, there's something about the truth. It will burn through the insulation if you proclaim it. Matter of fact, if your kinfolk argue, the more they argue, the more it proves that the Holy Spirit is eating their lunch. Working on them. What was the Shakespearean phrase? Methinks the damsel doth protest too much. Which is a way of saying, the more they argue, the more you know it's getting through. And they're squirming like a worm on hot pavement. Now, we don't, should not take delight in that. But we should take delight in the fact that God said His Word, He's going to send forth, and it's not going to come back without doing what He said it would do. Amen? It'll do exactly what He sent it to do. My Word will do it. He said, like the rain that falls from heaven. It won't come back in vapor until it's done what I sent it to do. So you see, one reason for doubt is that people just don't know. How should they believe in Him in whom they have not heard? Or maybe they have developing information. You remember the guy named Nicodemus? Nicodemus came to Jesus in the third chapter of John. It wasn't until the 19th chapter of John that he finally got right. That he finally got off the fence. That he finally decided that he was going to identify with his Savior and Lord and stop hiding it. Well, you know, Nicodemus had developing information. You see, believing is a process. It is a process of coming to a reasoned conclusion. God said, come let us reason together. And there is a reasonableness and there is a reasoning process to coming to faith. Now, mind you, truth has to be spiritually imparted. The Holy Spirit of God, while you're speaking the gospel, the Holy Spirit of God, that other voice. And you know my prayer more than anything else is that when I preach, that you hear that other voice, God's Spirit, bearing witness to your spirit that these things are true, that these things are compelling, that these things are necessary, that these things must be received and believed. But understand me, when missionaries go to a new field where the Bible has never gone, they don't start preaching the cross. They start preaching the Creator. 
They start preaching the moral law of God. They start preaching about the sacrificial system and understanding that only by the shedding of blood is remission of sin. Then they can preach the gospel because faith in Jesus Christ is a reason process. God says, come let us reason together. For though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. God's beckoning us to forgiveness and cleansing is a process of imparting information and we reason with Him. We honestly exchange. We don't argue with anger in a hard heart, but we, we dialogue with a willingness to hear. My friends, Nicodemus knew a lot about God, but he didn't know God. He didn't realize that God was standing in front of him. He realized there's something about Jesus. He said, man, nobody can have those miracles except he be from God. And then Jesus said, Nicodemus, you're going to have to get born again. Nicodemus said, what? <laughs> what is this born again stuff? You enter back into the womb? And no, no, no. Jesus said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. But you see, it took time for Nicodemus to hear and believe it was a reason process. You see, Jesus told him in John 3, 12, If I told you earthly things and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? He described the work of the Spirit like the blowing of the wind. You can't see it, but it's nonetheless real. So you see, Jesus was working with the man. He was helping him. His, his first doubt was, what is this board again? I doubt that there's such a thing. Because he couldn't figure it out in, the, in the, uh, the present context of information that he had. And then Jesus said, well, you know, see, if you don't understand the physical things I'm telling how are you going to understand spiritual things? So dealing with these kind of doubts can be a matter of time and listening and seeking. And then some doubts arise from what we call indecision. Do you know why this preacher tries to give an invitation? an altar call, an opportunity for you to do something about what you've heard. Because the Bible says, faith without works is dead. If you want to have a living faith, then you need to act on it. You need to have works of faith. And we're not talking about earning your way to heaven, but I'm telling you, the night that I finally heard the gospel of Jesus... My faith was dead until I took that first step and I came and I said, I want to pray with somebody. I want to ask God to forgive me. I want to invite Jesus into my life. I need to get saved. That's when faith became live and active and fruitful and saving faith. We have indecision and God will reveal something to us and we'll say, oh, I don't know if I can do that. I don't know if I want to do that. What would my friends think? What would my boss think? What would my wife think? What would my husband think? We go into indecision. But James tells us in chapter 1 and verse 6, Let him ask when we pray. Let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavers is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. And he says, don't let that man think he's going to get anything from God, as long as he keeps wavering. See, the wavering is a doubt. It's the doubt of indecision. And our doubts concerning the Lord should be taken to the Lord and resolved. We should give ourselves to that process now. In Hebrews chapter 3, it says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Friend, if God tells you something, if God speaks to your heart, I believe whenever the Word of God is preached that God the Holy Spirit is speaking. Paul said whether it's been, been preached of sincerity or whether it's being preached of contention, I don't care as long as it's preached because it'll still do the job. When the gospel is preached, you have a responsibility. That voice that speaks to your heart demands a response. Who was it? Josh McDowell or Lee Strobel wrote the book, uh, Evidence That Demands a Verdict. God demands a verdict. Up or down? Yes or no? Yea or nay? Make up your mind. Say, preacher, that's hard. Sure it is. But spending an eternity without Christ is even harder. 
burning in a devil's hell is about as hard as I can think. It's worth a little bit of effort. It's worth a little bit of struggle. It's worth a little bit of sweating and reasoning and begging and studying and seeking. It's worth it. God says, if you'll seek me with your whole heart, you will find me. God doesn't want half-hearted hearers. He wants those who respond. And so, one form of doubt comes from indecision. Uh, last of all, the worst kind of doubt, and I'll mention this here because it's not, it's not the kind that uh, Thomas had. This is unwillingness to believe. This is not a doubt based on information or the lack thereof. This is a doubt that says, I don't care how much evidence there is. It's the most astounding thing I can think of, of hard-heartedness. When I read the uh, 11th and 12th chapter of the Gospel of John, and I read about how Jesus walked up to the grave where Lazarus had been dead four days, he said, Lazarus, come out of there! And Lazarus came out of there, alive! And I read a little later on that the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees and the chief priests plotted to kill Lazarus because Lazarus was evidence that Jesus was more than just a prophet. You see, they not only refused the evidence, they wanted to squash the evidence because they didn't care how much evidence there was. They weren't going to hear it. Now if you have friends and loved ones in that condition, let me give you good news. There was one Saul of Tarsus who was dead set against Jesus of Nazareth that he traveled the country putting in prison and killing those who believed in Jesus. But Jesus dealt with his doubts. He erased his doubt. He popped in on the road to Damascus as a bright light that struck him blind, knocked him off his donkey. And he said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Saul still had a little doubt, but I, you know, inside him is like, oh, I know who this is. I know who this is. But he had to ask. He still had a little doubt left. He said, I mean, this is the bright light that knocked him to the ground. He, he could tell he was in the presence of the Holy One. He said, who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It's hard for you to kick against the cattle goat, isn't it? You know what Paul's next words were? I'm done. I'm through. What would you have me to do, Lord? You see, this was a man, he was not only a sin-hardened skeptic, he was a belligerent and bloodthirsty skeptic. Don't you doubt that God can't get through to anybody if they're willing. You see, there was some honesty in Paul. Paul was all zealous for the, the law of Moses and the faith of the fathers. He was so religious that he became prejudiced. He became so prejudiced in his religion that he didn't recognize God when God stood before him, you see. When the Sanhedrin asked Jesus if he was the Messiah in Luke chapter 22, verse 67, Jesus said this. If I tell you, you won't believe. Now, this is the worst kind of doubt. Jesus, knowing their hearts, said, If I tell you, you won't believe. In Mark chapter 11, Jesus told members of that same group that their problem with God's message to them through John the Baptist was that they were not willing to believe for, for long term. When God sent John, they didn't believe John either. They wouldn't believe John. They were afraid of the people because the people believed God, or believed in John, the message of John. But Jesus told them, your problem is you won't believe. This is the kind of doubt that condemns for eternity. In the city of Corinth, after Paul had taught them for three months, there was a certain group there in Acts chapter 19 that was described as they were hardened and believed not. 
They had hardened their heart, therefore they had doubt. They refused to believe. There's a lot of reasons for that. Will you let me just talk about it for just a moment? Would you let me get personal with you for just a moment? Because you know a believer can have problems with these things. You see a person doing pretty good. They're going to Sunday school. They're growing in the Lord. They start to get involved in ministry. And then there's a death in the family. And then there's something that changes. They get harder and they withdraw. They start being defeated. I've seen this happen a lot. Something, they lose a job. They, you know, God help us. You know, there are families that, uh, that are lost when a husband and wife are married. And, and then later on, one of them gets saved gloriously, filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, name written in the book of life, a changed person. And the other spouse says, I'll have none of that. And they walk away. And that believing spouse is left and discouraged and frustrated and they get into a downward spiral doubts can come to believers we can see that Gideon was a believer John the Baptist was a believer Thomas was a believer he was an apostle he made the second cut but he was struggling there was a hardness in his heart I won't believe unless I see it. You see, there's a mixture of motivations there. Part of it's honest inquiry. But part of it's hurt. You know what happens when you get hurt? I mean, if you have an old dog and, and he gets sick. Well, we don't have too many houses that are built up off the ground, but back in the old day, when our old hound dog, when we lived up in North Florida, down in North Florida, uh, when he got sick, he crawled up under the house and you got near him, he'd growl at you, leave me alone, is what he'd say, leave me alone. He was hurt. As long as he was hurting, he wanted to be left alone. You know, people do that. But you can't do it forever. You know, even old Elijah, that mighty, mighty man of faith, I ain't never called down fire from heaven. I'm telling you, this man had it in with God. He was tight. But he had a time when he was so frustrated, so discouraged, he said, oh God, please, just let me die. Just let me die. These things come upon all people. And they bring with them all manner of doubts. But we must deal with it. You see, the human heart can become hard through bitterness or filled with callous disregard for the truth because of our choice to link our life to something we shouldn't link it. There are people who have doubts today, and maybe this will shed some light on some of your friends and relatives that you're trying to reach for Christ. You know, there are certain doubts that come because a person has wedded themselves to things that they know are sinful. Sinful philosophies, simple actions, simple attitudes. A person who's addicted to pornography, a person who is a a heavy alcoholic, a person who is involved in, in, in other, you know, all kinds of sinful practices, but they become so addicted to it that deep in their heart they're saying, I can't imagine life without this. I can remember a time as a young person that I could not imagine life without alcohol or drugs. I didn't even want to think about life without alcohol or drugs because it had become my comfort, it had become my mainstay. I'm ashamed to admit it, but it was true. And there had to come a time in my life that I was willing to say, if I find something better, I'd be willing to give it up. My friends used to joke around and say, yeah, maybe one of these days we'll burn out on acid and become Jesus freaks. I became a Jesus freak and they couldn't stand me. But you see, we've got to deal with those things. It says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about people who are hardened. It says, they believed not the truth. They made a choice to say, no, I won't hear it. It says, but they had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so they were completely unwilling to let go of the temporary in order to experience the eternal joy and fulfillment. You know, when, when John speaks in 1 John about the three things that the flesh manifests itself in the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes 
and the pride of life. Friends, if you wed yourself to that, sure, every one of us live in the flesh. Every one of us are tempted in those areas. And maybe some have stumbled into those areas. But there's got to be a willingness to say, this ain't worth dying for. This is not worth burning in hell for eternity. You see, that's the kind of doubt when you cannot be reasoned with. Thomas, on the other hand, his doubts were honest. They were the struggles of an honest heart desiring truth. And so he was able to respond immediately to Jesus' personal revelation. By the way, may I tell you that right where you are, the Lord knows you. He sees you. He hears the thoughts of your heart. He knows where you came from. He knows where you're going. He knows what makes you tick. And because of that, He will deal with you in a personal way. The same way He dealt with Thomas. Because Thomas was willing to bring his doubts to Jesus. Jesus was able to work in Thomas's life. And erase the doubt. Friend, God is at work around you. He wants to be at work in your life. May I ask you this question? What is He doing? What is He saying to you? <laughs> the bony finger of the conviction of the Holy Spirit. What is the Holy Spirit pointing to in your life? Saying, that needs to go and I will remove it for you. If you don't, you'll be in doubt. You'll be in discouragement. You'll be in defeat. Now yes, Thomas was an analytical person. He was skeptical by nature. But Jesus dealt with him accordingly. Remember back when uh, Jesus went to raise Lazarus from the dead? You remember what Thomas said? Let's go die, uh, excuse me, let's go with him and we'll go die with him. See, Thomas was skeptical. He figured, oh no, there's trouble in Jerusalem. If Jesus goes and raises Lazarus from the dead, the Pharisees are all going to kill us all. Well, let's go with him. We'll die with him. You see, he, he had struggles with his skepticism, but he was willing to stick with Jesus. He had found the pearl of great price. He had sold everything to buy that farm. You see? And so that he, though he was struggling now, with that skepticism, I gotta see it, I gotta see it. He still brought it to Jesus. Later in John chapter 14, when Jesus told the other disciples, all of them, he said, In my father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come again, and receive you unto myself, that where I am there, you may be also. And he says, You know the way, the way you know. What did Thomas say? Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? You see, skeptical Thomas. He's analytical. He needs evidence. Jesus is working with him. And so what does Jesus do? He comes to Thomas in that room. How did he come to Thomas? Did he come with that big hickory saying, Bend over, son. I'm going to let you have it. No. Did you ever read Isaiah's prophecy and how it was fulfilled in Jesus? Speaking of Jesus, it said when he came, a bruised reed he will not break. A smoking flax he will not quench. Jesus lovingly, patiently, same way he'll do with you, gently walked up to Thomas. He mocked him a little bit. Thomas said, I gotta see, gotta touch, gotta thrust. And Jesus said, see, touch, thrust, examine. Verse 27. See, Thomas, let my wounds speak to you. Brother, sister, wounds of Jesus speak to us. They indict us of our sinfulness. But they include us in His sacrifice. And they ensure us that our sins have been purged. 
Fanny Crosby was blind, but she wrote these words. When my life's work has ended and I cross the swelling tide, when the bright and glorious morning I shall see, I shall know my Redeemer when I reach the other side and His smile will be the first to welcome me. I shall know Him. I shall know Him. And redeemed by His side, I shall stand. I shall know Him. I shall know Him by the prince of the nails in His hands. Jesus said to Thomas, Thomas, look, I did this for you. And he says to you, look at this. I did this for you. I know that Thomas was an honest skeptic and an honest doubter and seeker. Because Thomas was a great repenter. Thomas's need was evidence. It was, and that's why Jesus showed it to him. Jesus wouldn't have showed him evidence if that wasn't his need. What did Thomas say? That old boy got down there at the feet of Jesus. I imagine he just like Mary took a hold of his feet. And he said, my Lord and my God. Thomas never doubted again. Well, little doubts. They say that Thomas went all the way to India carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ. They say the people got so mad at his preaching that they shoved him off a cliff. My Lord. My God. And then Jesus said this. Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. But blessed are those who haven't seen and yet believe. May I tell you that you don't need to see. You don't. You can see through the eyes of faith. 